morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to what is our last grand rounds, last uh, our last grand rounds for this uh, academic year. We'll start again in September, Jennifer, and just a few housekeeping events. Please complete those surveys. Those help us tremendously, and also feel free to put in requests for um, um, guest speakers or and or topics. I, I want to remind everyone that this is being video conference and videotaping. So please use the microphones at the end to ask questions. And as I mentioned, we're ending with a, a bang, if you will. It's a real privilege for me to introduce uh, Dr. Gerald Laurie, who really needs no introduction here. He's the Michael E. DeBakey Distinguished Chair of Cardiac Surgery, Professor of Surgery. Um, and he completed his original training in Sydney, uh, Australia, and joined Dr. DeBakey and completed his uh, CV fellowship back in the early 70s. And really has had a tremendous career over the past 40 years when you sit back and uh, think about it. It's really internationally recognized, world export, and in, in multiple aspects of CV surgery, but particular focus in on valvular heart disease. And so it's a real privilege for us to hear from the world's expert um, about ischemic mitral regurgitation. So Dr. Lori, as always, I really appreciate your participation in Grand Rounds. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, we are going to talk about the unsolved problem of ischemic mitral regurgitation. Uh, there are a number of uh, conditions where there's coronary artery disease and mitral regurgitation, but these are not uh, what we uh, reserve the term ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation to describe. That includes papillary muscle rupture, infarction, large acute MIs with diffusely dilated left ventricles, chronic ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, non-ischemic dilated cardiop cardiomyopathy with incidental coronary disease, uh, coronary artery disease in someone who has a myxomatous mitral valve. Uh, each of these are very different uh, pathophysiologies from ischemic MR as we now confine that term. Uh, we have an AA, American Association for Thoracic Surgery has uh, developed consensus guidelines and this is the definition. So you can see that here, that's how we define ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation. So I hope you take note of that. This is actually a, a, a summary of it. Uh, basically, the essence of the definition of chronic ischemic mitral regurgitation is that it's an anatomically normal mitral valve with uh, mitral leaflets and cordy, and in systole, there's tethering of the leaflets. The leaflet, is, one or both leaflets are pulled down into the ventricle. Typically, the mitral annulus is not very dilated. Uh, it is flattened. The anterior part of the annulus is, uh, the saddle of the annulus is flattened down. The uh, left ventricle is abnormal with a basal inferior infarct, and this is the key uh, sine qua non of uh, ischemic MR, this injury to the uh, basal inferior portion of the heart. Secondary to severe ischemia with or without uh, one or more myocardial infarctions. Typically, the ejection fraction in these people is reduced to about 40%. These are not people in cardiogenic shock or with EFs in the 20s. This is the typical appearance. Here we're doing a coronary bypass on a patient, base of the heart, apex, and this is the inferior wall of the left ventricle, you can see with this scarring here. Now, anterior infarctions tend to be larger, and they're positioned away from the papillary muscles. The papillary muscles are located in the posterior half of the left ventricle. You can see over here, this is with the mitral valve taken out, and we have the posterior medial papillary muscle, anterolateral papillary muscle, and this is the position of an inferior infarct over here, the anterior infarct drop over here. And it's the inferior infarct extending from uh, uh, just up into the septum down and around to just uh, before the, or just under the anterolateral papillary muscle, that really the genesis of this complex series of events that leads to ischemic mitral regurgitation. And you can have a very small inferior infarct in this area and develop uh, mitral regurgitation or you can have a very diseased ventricle that's dilated and not have ischemic mitral regurgitation. So this is the area that's critical in understanding the genesis and treatment of this problem. This is an MRI study where they looked at multiple patients with uh, extensive infarction of the ventricle, and they analyzed the uh, parameters that had to be present uh, for the patients to have ischemic mitral regurgitation. And what they found is that all patients with ischemic MR had an inferior wall injury and some dilatation of the mitral annulus. 
Dr. Kuman Ahoso studied uh, the difference between inferior MI and anterior wall MI, and they found that in the presence of inferior MI, uh, mitral leaflet tenting area, which we'll talk about in a minute, was always greater. The uh, percent of mitral uh, size of jet was larger. Interestingly, the anterior papillary muscle tethering was uh, similar in both groups, but posterior papillary muscle tethering distance was markedly increased. And that means the uh, papillary muscle is down lower in the ventricle in ischemic MR uh, due to an inferior infarct. Now, many years ago, Dr. Carpentier uh, described the asymmetrical nature of the annulus in ischemic mitral regurgitation. And this is an absolute characteristic also. It's typical for the annulus not to be symmetrically dilated here posteriorly, but rather the main dilatation is of the P2 and P3 segment. Dr. Kaji studied uh, the uh, changes in the morphology of the annulus in the ischemic MR. And here's the normal annulus with the saddle anteriorly, A2, and then going down and flattening out at uh, P2 posteriorly. In ischemic MR, it's common to have some dilatation of the subaortic uh, and aortic mitral membrane area. And then the whole annulus is flattened, the saddle is lower. And then you see this asymmetrical enlargement between uh, 5, 4, and 3 here, 5, 4, and 3. And this asymmetrical enlargement is characteristic of ischemic mitral regurgitation. That's the P2, P3 area. And if you look here intraoperatively, we have a patient anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, aorta up here. And you can see here very distinctly this asymmetrical enlargement of the mitral annulus. Usually they get dilated up to about 35, 37 millimeters. These are not massively dilated like myxoma's disease. And you can also see here, we've got the ventricle inflated. You can also here, see here very good apposition, P1, P, E1, and some of P2. But as you come over here, you can see a lot more leaflet exposed, which means there's very little apposition in this area. And this area here is overlying the posteromedial papillary muscle. And this gives us a clue that it's the posteromedial portion of the mitral apparatus that is going to be the problem. This is the right fibrous trigone, which is located just up here where that stay stitch is. And this is the commissure, which is right there. So the area that's most affected is this posteromedial portion of the posterior wall and the adjacent septum. The uh, difference uh, in this asymmetry uh, that occurs in ischemic MR is that in uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, the dilatation of the annulus is symmetrical. The, the annular dilatation due to diffuse dilatation of the heart is typically a symmetrical dilatation of the annulus, whereas the annulus in true ischemic mitral regurgitation is asymmetrical. And that's work from the Cleveland Clinic. Here's the typically dilated cardiomyopathy. And these people don't really have tethering of the mitral leaflets. They simply have a situation where the whole heart is dilated, everything's moved apart, and they've run out of leaflet area for the leaflets to come together. They've got a big annulus, big ventricle, everything's too big for the leaflets to come together. So that's a different mechanism, mitral regurgitation, distinct from ischemic MR. The mechanism of ischemic MR is mitral valve tethering, and the mitral valve tethering is due to papillary muscle displacement and the papillary muscle displacement is due to ischemic distortion of the wall of the left ventricle in the inferior part of the heart. So that's now our consensus. That's the, the type of MR that we now call ischemic MR. And for the sake of advancement of knowledge, we've got to stop incorporating uh, this into the general category of functional MR. We no longer call this functional MR. We no longer classify this as functional MR, this is ischemic MR, and functional MR is what you see in dilated cardiomyopathy. If you go back in the literature, you keep seeing these things mixed together, and it's made it extremely difficult to make progress in understanding how to fix these people with true ischemic MR. It's not uncommon for the anterior leaflet, as well as the posterior leaflet, to uh, be involved, and this is because of the anatomy of the cordy, the posterior medial papillary muscle, gives caudal to support to the A2 and A3 areas of the anterior leaflet as well as the P2, P3 area of the posterior leaflet. So here you can see a patient who's had an inferior wall MI and he's got a restricted motion 
with tethering of the anterior leaflet. And you can see here on the uh, 3D echo, he's got this typically dilated annulus in this area. And you can see the major part of the leak here is coming through the A2, A3, P2, P3 area of the uh, orifice. Now, uh, in addition to the inferior wall infarct and the fact that you've got an akinetic area and maybe it's stretching up a little bit, there's a complex uh, effect this has on the uh, disposition of the papillary muscles. And the normal arrangement of the papillary muscles is that they are uh, positioned below and just posterior to the commissures that they serve. Uh, they're not positioned in the middle of the leaf, they're out at each commissure. And in diastole, you can see this representation here, there's, they're widely separated. Uh, that's called the interpapillary muscle distance, the IPMD. And then in systole, the, uh, the posterior part of the heart uh, rolls medially and the posterior medial papillary muscle is pulled up towards the septum and the anterolateral papillary muscle is pulled behind it and up towards the posterior medial papillary muscle. So this is what's meant to happen and in, in uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, at rest these papillary muscles are further apart the posterior medial papillary muscle is further away from the septum, it's more laterally disposed, and then in systole, uh, they remain abnormally far apart, usually greater than 20 millimeter distance between the papillary muscles. So if we look here at MRI cross sections, here in a normal patient in uh, diastole, you can see the anterolateral and posterior medial papillary muscle base, the septum here, you can see a little separation from the septum. And then in systole, everything is rolled around in this direction. And in addition to the contraction of the heart, there is a torsional element here where the uh, mitral annulus is rotated clockwise looking from the apex. So these are looking down from the annulus. So it looks counterclockwise, but looking from the apex, this is the clockwise ringing of the apical part and the anti-clockwise ringing of the, uh, of the uh, clockwise ringing of the, the basal heart and the anti-clockwise ringing of the apex, the so-called torsion uh, of the heart. So these, this phenomenon here is very dependent on torsion as well as simple contraction. And the patient ends up with this disposition of the papillary muscles, the posterior medial papillary muscle is abnormally uh, far away from the commissure here because it hasn't come up to the septum and the two papillary muscles are separated from each other because of the loss of the contractility and torsion in this area underneath them. And if we look here again at our anatomical specimen, you can see in this area this absence of torsion is going to prevent this and this moving in the correct direction towards the septum in systole. And this is a very basic mechanism we haven't fully appreciated the significance of until we've had these MRI studies done in uh, very recent years. Well, in order to quantify ischemic MR, we use a uh, little collection of standard measurements, and you'll see these, the literature is full of these measurements, trying to work out what numbers mean what. And basically, we draw a plane across the mitral annulus, and then underneath that, we have an area called the mitral valve tending area that gives us an index of how tender the leaflets are. The deeper this goes down, the more tenting there is, and the valve area gets bigger. And then we have the coaptation distance, which is from the tip of the leaflets up to the uh, uh, top of the zone of coaptation. <coughs> there are two very important angles, which happen to be actually some of the most uh, powerful predictors of success or failure in repair. And these are the anterior tethering angle and the posterior tethering angle. And these are simply the angle between the leaflets and the uh, plane of the annulus. And the posterior tethering angle, once that gets past about 30 to 40 degrees, those kind of people are difficult to repair. We can also uh, get some idea of the position of the tips of the papillary muscles by measuring the uh, tethering length. And that's the distance from the tip of the papillary muscle up to the uh, center of the anterior portion at A2 of the mitral annulus. So these numbers are useful in the literature when we're trying to analyze why some people do well and some people don't. Now, the natural history of ischemic mitral regurgitation is bad. This is some data from a busy emergency room in actually Jerusalem, and they analyzed the about 1,200 patients coming through the ER with infarcts. Uh, 
uh, about 40% of the people had ischemia, mostly moderate, and they followed them along for four or five years after their ER visit. And even moderate uh, and mild ischemic MR have a very significant impact on the condition of the patient in terms of readmissions for heart failure and mortality. Severe MR is a very uh, serious complication, and even moderate and mild MR have an elevated mortality rate. So these people who uh, end up with uh, MR, EF for EF, if you got MR, you're going to have a much worse outlook than if you didn't have MR. Now, as surgeons, the main uh, place we encounter ischemic MR is in the setting of people who need coronary artery bypass. So there's been a lot of interest on uh, how to uh, manage the coexistence of uh, coronary artery disease and the ischemic MR that's occurred because of that coronary artery disease. So this is a study from uh, combined uh, data from Duke and from uh, Mass General, and they got uh, 3,200 patients together. The people who had severe MR were just taken out and operated on, so they didn't form part of this uh, study. So it's a study of mostly no MR compared with mild and moderate MR. And they followed these people along for an average of three years. And what they found was that people with no MR did the best. People with even mild MR had a significant uh, reduction in survival. And people with moderate MR had very severe depression about a 15-20% uh, survival disadvantage. So the presence of ischemic MR, even after successful coronary bypass surgery, continues to develop an, uh, an adverse influence on the outcome of these people. So clearly it's not just a matter of restoring blood flow. And it's clearly uh, this kind of MR in people with myxomatous disease would be something we'd just be following year by year and not worrying about. So there's something very malignant about uh, ischemic MR. We have this uh, really, I would say, it's been elevated from controversial to uh, renowned to legendary paper from the Cleveland Clinic uh, of 390 patients with ischemic MR and uh, coronary artery disease uh, who were then analyzed by propensity match analysis, which gave two groups of 54 patients each, so it was a pretty small study. But they followed these people along, and a number of surgeons did a number of different repairs and uh, they had non-propensity and propensity matched data. And what they found was that survival with or without mitral valve repair added to the coronary was the same. They found that in the patients with ischemic MR, the uh, one-year recurrence rate of MR was 12%, and that ended up going up a little higher. That's for three plus, four plus. Almost all the patients had some degree of residual MR, mild to moderate. And then in the coronary group, uh, the MR persisted, and 40% of the people out at uh, uh, three or four years still had uh, 40, 50%. So half the people got some recovery of their MR, even with just coronary bypass, but half didn't. And that's a pretty standard figure. Interestingly, clinically, the two groups did well. They both benefited from coronary bypass, but the fixing of the mitral valve did not improve the symptom status uh, uh, at long-term follow-up. Now, another a big uh, registry study from uh, Duke alone uh, came out in 2014 from Dr. Castleberry. And in this study, they had all uh, severities of MR, uh, and uh, they compared category uh, treatment by either medical treatment with the coronary bypass, PCI, uh, coronary bypass grafting, or coronary bypass plus mitral valve repair or replacement. And this is what they found. The best uh, survival was with coronary bypass alone. Next best was CAB plus uh, mitral valve repair or replacement. PCI had the lowest interventional survival, and medical therapy had the worst outcomes. So again, we have this uh, conundrum where seemingly our efforts to fix the whole problem, the ischemic heart disease, with coronary bypass or revascularization and fixing the valve has not led to the desired outcome. And this 10-year uh, survival here is pretty depressed. I mean, 50% uh, survival is pretty poor. We'd expect at least 70 to 80% survival at 10 years in this kind of group. So these people 
definitely have a problem when they have ischemic MR of any severity. Well, we now have four randomized prospective studies that have been performed. And this study from Dr. Fatouk from Palermo in Italy uh, is, in my opinion, the best of the studies, the best designed, the best executed. And uh, the surgery performed was excellent. There was almost no residual mitral regurgitation throughout the study in that group. Uh, 102 patients, you remember that? Uh, paper from uh, Cleveland Clinic, their analysis of the propensity matching was 104, so it's a respectable size, actually. And so the two groups were divided up. These are pretty classic ischemic MR patients. Uh, typically, uh, we see the inferior infarct and uh, anterior infarct much fewer. And it is interesting that some of these people had both, and this is an important phenomenon because, as we'll talk about later, some of these ischemic MR people, as time goes by, start having more problems and their ventricles gradually dilate and they basically turn themselves into functional MR because they've got dilated ischemic cardiomyopathy. So there's a period where they're classic ischemic and then over time they become something else. So these people had mostly triple vessel coronary disease, EF in the 40s. Uh, this is a very common figure as we mentioned at the beginning, around 40% is the typical ejection fraction we see, moderately dilated ventricles and markedly increased uh, tenting area. Once again, no difference in survival at five years. So here's another study with no difference in survival at five years. However, uh, the uh, MR got a little less in the medical group, although as it got less, it got more severe. Fewer people had it, but it got more severe. The interesting data from the uh, echo follow-up is that the uh, CAB plus mitral valve group had a much better outcome in terms of their left ventricular function. The end diastolic, end systolic dimensions came down much more. The ejection fractions went up much more. <coughs> the tenting area went down remarkably better, as you'd expect, than the medical therapy. The uh, people felt a lot better. Their uh, mean New York heart class went from 2.3 to 0.6 with surgery and mitral valve repair, and it, it didn't change much uh, with the uh, CAB group alone. And the mean MR grade in this study, which, as I said, had excellent surgical results, was uh, almost none, less than one plus. So this is a very good study, and it shows us two things that, uh, one, uh, repairing the mitral valve doesn't seem to affect survival at the five-year mark, even when the surgery's been done very well. And number two, it hasn't affected survival despite the fact that these people's left ventricles are working a lot better. So the next study was a British study called the RIME study, and this was carried out, published in 2012. And this was a small study, 73 patients, and it was designed to assess not survival because it was only designed to go for a year. It was designed to assess uh, whether functional capacity and left ventricular reverse remodeling would be improved by adding uh, mitral valve repair. And this study uh, showed that the primary endpoint, which was change in peak uh, consumption of oxygen, was uh, positive for CAB plus mitral valve repair. There was a 33% increase in the average peak O2 consumption in the surgical group, and only 6% of the CAB people had that improvement. And then the secondary endpoints were left ventricular and systolic volume index, mitral regurgitation severity, level of BNP, and all of these were better in the CAB mitral group versus the CAB only group. In the CAB only group, 47% of people had persistent moderate MR at one year, but only 3% had uh, moderately severe MR. So MR wasn't too bad uh, on long-term follow-up, but it was similar to what they started off with. So this was not a survival study, but it was another study confirming that the addition of mitral valve repair to CAB resulted in superior left ventricular performance at one year. Now we come to our two US-based studies from the uh, cardiovascular thoracic uh, surgery study network, the CTSN. And there were two studies, and the first of these was the treatment of a moderate ischemic MR whether you, uh, you should add or not add mitral valve repair. Uh, 
And the results of this study uh, showed uh, that there was no difference in the uh, degree of uh, the left ventricular end systolic volume index, which was the primary, uh, deter primary endpoint for the study. <coughs> Death rates very similar, hospital readmissions similar, neurological events more common, there were more strokes with surgery plus mitral valve repair. MR of moderate or severe degree were higher in the CAB only group, 32% persistent uh, MR versus 11% in the surgically treated with uh, repair. The global wall motion index was higher in the patients free of moderate or severe MR uh, 16, after repair, 16.5% versus 7.4%. The region wall, wall motion also improved 18% versus 7.9%. So in this subgroup from this randomized study, examined after the study was completed, showed that in people who'd had a mitral valve repair and were free of MR, their ventricles were working better also. But that was a, a subgroup selected out from the subgroup. Again, similar mortality. This is only two-year data, which is very short for looking at mortality with valve disease and uh, no ma uh, major adverse event rate, very similar. The fourth study and the second of these US-based uh, randomized studies from the CTSN group was to compare the use of repair versus prosthetic valve replacement for the treatment of severe mitral regurgitation. <coughs> this study, unfortunately, uh, for reasons that are still not clear, uh, was basically <coughs> rendered more or less useless by the fact that uh, the mitral regurgitation of moderate or severe severity recurred in 30% of the patients within 30 days of surgery. And that had risen to 44% by 12 months. So when we look at the data from this study, unfortunately we're looking at a group of patients who underwent surgery, but basically the surgery was essentially ineffective and the treatment uh, would not be expected to have any effect except the fact you've had to put them through a major operation. So uh, basically the, the, the findings of the study were severe ischemic MR, uh, repair or replacement, no, no between group differences. And mitral regurgitation recurred more frequently in the repair group, obviously, than in the replacement group, which is certainly what you would hope as a surgeon. The uh, death rate in both groups was similar. The uh, major uh, composite endpoint was similar. Now, there was an, a post hoc analysis. This is after the study was closed. They went back and looked at people who had had a successful repair. This is similar to the previous study. And they found that in people who had had a successful repair, one of the 60% uh, of patients whose repair were successful, there was a 30% reduction in the left ventricular end diastolic volume index. No patient with a prosthetic valve had any uh, improvement in, or reverse remodeling. This is despite the fact that uh, caudal sparing surgery was used for the prosthetic valve. There was another analysis done after this study was concluded, and they, after both of the previous studies were concluded, and they got all the patients who'd had a recurrence and looked at their characteristics, trying to work out why they had had so many recurrences. And basically, the result of the analysis was that the principal predictor and a strong predictor way above the other ones of failure was a large inferior wall uh, dyskinesis or aneurysm. And so this was the primary if things were really bad back here, uh, the repair rate was very poor. So you might say to yourself, well, why not just stop messing with this mitral valve repair and let's just uh, replace these in all these people and get it over and done with? Well, uh, we have some very interesting data, which is from patients with degenerative disease, McSonnell's disease, from a study organized by, by Dr. Enrique Serrano at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, international study, four centers, about 2,000 patients, and the data from this was just published this year. And at 10 years, these were all people with flail mitral valves, and they were, everyone was asked to repair them, and some of them couldn't repair them, so they ended up with prostheses. And when they looked at the data, at 10 years, there was a 20% survival reduction in these matched patients uh, for people who had a prosthetic mitral valve. So there's no question that when we replace someone's mitral valve, we're in 
incurring a major survival penalty on them compared with a successful repair. So this is from degenerative disease. This is not based on ischemic disease, but it does give pause and make us uh, continue to feel like we need to get on top of being able to repair these ischemic MRs correctly. So what have been the predictors in the literature of restrictive uh, annuloplasty failure in ischemic MR? Well, uh, Dr. Boma uh, in, in 2010 published a very extensive, very thick uh, review of uh, all the literature uh, in which restrictive annuloplasty failure was analyzed. And basically uh, what he found was that these echocardiographic parameters such as tenting area, tenting height, were not very good predictors. But this posterior tethering angle, you remember that angle between the plane of the annulus and the posterior mitral leaf was slowing down? If that was above 45 degrees, that was 100% sensitive and 95% specific in predicting failure. So there comes a degree of restriction where the techniques used in these studies, and we'll say a bit more about that later, have been ineffective. And similarly, an anterior tethering angle of 40 degrees was associated with highly, uh, high prediction of failure. And then if you uh, do a ratio based on those two measurements, of course, you get a pretty good. Uh, and then the other thing they found was that the interpapillary muscle distance, remember we've been talking about how those papillary muscles are separated, if that separation is greater than 20 millimeters, that's also a very strong predictor of uh, recurrent MR. And that's another measure of the degree of disruption of the geometry caused by that infarct in the area in which those papillary muscles are located. <coughs> the next group of uh, indices of the left ventricular function basically indicate that as we get bigger and bigger ventricles and they get more spherical and they get weaker, and they've got more and more wall motion abnormalities, and they've got uh, uh, bad ventricle, this is what we're talking about. You get into this uh, group where the ventricle is really short, and it looks like we just can't repair those people uh, with the current approaches that we have. And the mitral annular diameter is typically not very enlarged in the ischemic MR, and so as you get above 37 uh, millimeters, that gets to be a moderately strong uh, predictor. And this is what uh, these bad, uh, what the mitral valve look, in, look like in these people who have had recurrent ischemic MR and have these bad hearts. Normal mitral annulus here, nice shape to it, a little curve at the back, nice big saddle at the front, and the leaflets are fairly flat in, uh, end of, uh, when they're closed. Here are the repaired patients. They've got bigger annuluses. They've had a reduction annuloplasty. And you'll notice the leaflets aren't sticking down very much. There's not, this is the, uh, the, that's the plane of the annulus, and that's the posterior leaflet sloping down. So that's probably a 25 millimeter uh, tenting angle for the posterior leaflet in there. So those people are doing fine. And if you look underneath, things look pretty flat in terms of the leaflets. And then you come to the recurrent people, and you'll notice they've tended to have uh, smaller rings put on because you, you're just in there and it's leaking. You keep pulling and making it smaller and smaller until finally you get the Cooley concept, which is that every form of mitral regurgitation can be corrected with a 22 millimeter annuloplasty That's ring. Right. When I came to Houston, you had a slide cutting up annuloplasty rings off a 22 millimeter Dacron graft and using them to use on his patients. So, but that, that tends to have a little bit of mitral stenosis with them. So here's the recurrent MR, a little smaller. The saddle is flatter. And when you look down here, this is like a big beak. This is the steep, vertically sloping leaflets. See how much further down the leaflets are now? That's because they're, they're pulled down. They're not like this. They're down like this. And that's a severity of tenting that can be difficult to overcome with the traditional surgical techniques. So uh, this paper, which was also another one that Boomer had done, which is, relates to those pictures you're just looking at, shows that uh, annular dimensions and things don't really seem to have much of a predictive value, but the mitral valve tethering index, which is based on the two angles, has a very strong predictive value. It's the strongest in the whole study, 2.48. And then uh, segmental tethering angle, which was also measured, the A3 
the P2 and the P3, when they've got a lot of tethering, it's again at that posteromedial commissure is where the action is. When, if you've got an A3, a P2, or a P3 that's badly tethered, that's very highly predictive of a bad outcome. So there was another uh, paper out from the CTS and investigators still looking for an explanation of why the surgical results were so poor in their two randomized studies we've talked about. <coughs> and they've proposed another concept, which is that there is a thing such as known as left ventricle to annular plasty ring mismatch. And what they're talking about is that if you have someone with a big left ventricle and you put in a ring that's too small, here's a 52 millimeter ventricle and someone's put in a 26 millimeter ring and they've got uh, persistent MR, that maybe that ratio will be a predictor of a problem. I think really it's a description of a problem that you've got a ventricle that's very big, poor surgeon's trying to get rid of the MR and he keeps making it smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally, that's as good as he can do and that's the guy's left with a small ring. But the data from this study is very interesting, the echo data, because they divided up the uh, severity of the mismatch into four quartiles, starting with less mismatch over here at quartile one and maximum mismatch over here at quartile four. And basically what this shows to me is that if you run down this list of uh, severity of MR, ERO, LVEF, endostatic dimension, cystic dimension, endostatic volume, and cystic volume, as you go across this chart from left to right, you end up over here, and these people have really bad ventricles. They've got uh, ERO of 30.34, ejection fractions 35, end diastolic dimension 64, systolic 56, end uh, diastolic volume 245, and uh, end systolic 164. And these are the most badly diseased as far as their ventricles in the whole study. So it's really not a hypothesis to find out anything. It's really just a description of what they found. This doesn't lead anywhere to me at all. So I, I think it's good that they're looking and trying to find an explanation, but I think this is a description of what was there, not an explanation. So we get back to this fundamental concept. We've looked at the studies. We've looked at how the ventricles get better. We look at in some of the studies the patients got better. In other studies they didn't get any better than just with coronary bypass surgery. But again we get back to this concept of the evolution uh, the, and the dynamic nature of this problem which is ischemic MR in some patients is going to be a dynamic process with progression from a nice is classic ischemic MR where we've got uh, a nice little inferior MI, good EF, local LV remodeling, making the papillary muscles come apart and malposition, leaflet tethering, and this Carpentier type 3B leaflet motion, which is a tethered leaflet. And then over time, going through an intermediate phase or they have another infarct and they end up as basically functional MR where none of this physiology applies they have a spherical LV, they have an EF of 25%, big annulus, and they're shot. So uh, our efforts, I think, really need to shift from just what we're doing to these valve leaflets and trying to position them differently and do different things to a more fundamental study of the uh, LV itself. And this study just came out in the last month or so and this is emblematic of what I think we should be doing, and uh, Deepan Shah and I are already talking about organizing a study to do some more work along these lines. And what they've done here is used MRI to calculate strain levels in people who've had inferior wall MIs and have not developed uh, ischemic mitral regurgitation. That's the top row. And the bottom row is ischemic MR in patients who've had an inferior wall MI. So this is MI plus IMR, and this is MI only. And basically, you're looking into a, a cup, and they've rotated the cup around so you can see all the areas. So that's what all these different views are, but just in the interest of time, we just focus in on this one down here, and what you can see here, we're looking in here, and we've got the two papillary muscles, the posterior medial papillary muscle and the anterolateral muscle. We're looking through the annulus down to the apex, and this is the uh, probably P2, P3, and P1 in this area here. And then uh, down here, you can see the effect of the 
or you can see that in people with ischemic MR, there's a very high strain level in the area of this inferior wall infarct. So you've got a very high strain level adjacent to the posterior medial and anterolateral papillary muscles. And we know very well from uh, other forms of infarction that uh, infarcts can cause strain on adjacent tissues and the ventricle as a whole, and over time, that takes a toll on the ventricle. So this type of data may lead us towards uh, uh, the missing link, which accounts for the lack of survival benefits from successful uh, surgery for ischemic MR, at least from the point of view of eliminating the MR. And we need to do a lot more of this, and uh, this is something we're going to be working on here now that we're pretty much done with the myxomatous work that's consumed a lot of our time. We're going to start working on this problem. Uh, Another very interesting topic is uh, mitral leaflet growth. And there's been a pretty steady little body of work on the fact that people with uh, mitral regurgitation tend to have larger leaflets than people without mitral regurgitation. And it's been documented that mitral leaflets can grow in response to the onset of mitral regurgitation. And there's now some uh, biological work, and I promised one of my colleagues that we would uh, have some molecules here. That's why he came to the lecture. So this is the molecule slide. And uh, basically, they've been able to demonstrate that there are two groups of patients, one who respond to uh, uh, MR with uh, leaflet growth and one that do not respond with leaflet growth. And they've identified mediators that get switched on and off that uh, determine what's going to happen to the individual patient. And the importance of leaflet growth is you can have a moderately dilated LV or you can have a moderate amount of tethering and if the leaflets aren't coming together and then they start growing bigger and they do come together. So you don't have MR or you have less MR. So this is going to be a very interesting topic to pursue because potentially it could be a therapy. If you have someone with moderate MR, instead of a mitra clip, we'll give them a pill and we'll, you know, just grow some more leaflet for them. No need for any, uh, any interventions. So the, the real issue as we struggle with these people uh, is uh, whether an annual leaflet, uh, annual level procedure such as an annual plastic can really uh, help the ventricle or are we just fixing the mitral regurgitation and not helping the ventricle. Myxoma's disease, the ventricle is normal. We fix the MR and the problem's over. Nothing's going to happen to that patient. They don't have MR, their ventricle's normal, nothing happens. These people have a ventricle that's been damaged. They've got this complex activity posteriorly, and they can continue to get in trouble from that. And can the annular adjustment alter the ventricle, or are we just dealing with something that's getting rid of MR? Well, there is some evidence from Dr. Miller's uh, sheep studies that the... Uh, Appropriate uh, annular level procedure can, in fact, have some impact on the uh, ventricle. And what they did was uh, get some sheep, uh, ligate the circumflex coronary artery, get a dilated ventricle, and then they did annular plasties on the sheep. And they found that they reduced the annulus, but in addition, they also reduced LV dimensions below that. The problem is that sometimes in this setting, reducing LV dimensions contrary to what you might expect, increases strain on the myocardium because of the disposition of the three layers of the myocardium, the subepicardial, the uh, circumferential, and the subendocardial layers, and you actually end up with a ventricle that's in worse shape. Even though in this uh, setting we've made the ventricle smaller, the uh, nature of the disease is such that that actually can make the strain worse. So these are issues that really need to be looked at very closely and really have not been looked at, but they're, it's just beginning to come into the literature, people looking in more detail. Because the thickening of the ventricle involves torsion in two different directions, subepicardial is one way, subendocardial is the other, and uh, there's all sorts of little groups of cells that have to shear across each other, and all of this stuff can be disrupted pretty badly by a posterior MI. So what options are there for ischemic MR? Um, well, we have this loss of coaptation. In some people, you see that the anterior leaf is restricted, and they've got that seagull effect, so people have cut those cordy and improved things. This hasn't become a very well-established procedure because it, this uh, junction between the papillary muscle and the uh, anterior aortic annulus here through the strut cordy, which are the ones that get cut, 
actually is called the aorto uh, ventricular loop and is responsible for the correct positioning of the aorta and the aortic mitral continuity during systole. So when you cut that, in animals at least they have a big problem. The patients seem to have done a little better, but that's still up in the air as to how good that is. Uh, people have placated the tips of the papillary muscles together and uh, that's been reported, but again, no one's really uh, been able to come up with a series with good results. This is separate from bringing the base of the papillary muscles together. That's another topic we'll touch on. But the tips, that doesn't seem to be terribly good. If we have this infarct and uh, we placate it, then obviously that will take the wall of the ventricle from this position to this position. Uh, these were done sporadically and then people have lost interest in it. It may be that uh, as we get a better idea of uh, strain patterns and exactly what the nature of the problem is that we may need to revisit some kind of uh, remodeling of the uh, area of the infarct on the left ventricle. But currently this is really not being performed. Another option which uh, Dr. Crone in Virginia uh, described was putting a stitch down into the tip of the papillary muscle which has fallen down and out here and cinching it up to the mitral annulus, thereby restoring the problem. Another device that's now off the market was a big needle that you put across the ventricle from the uh, bulging posterior portion here with a pad and you brought out the anterior wall and then under echo you could adjust that length until you had the right uh, left ventricular and systolic dimension. But as I say, that uh, company went belly up. So the papillary muscle base is the next uh, potential target for helping the ventricular part to f uh, enhance the outcome uh, of the annuloplasty. And that involves bringing these papillary muscles back together so they're under that 20 millimeter dimension that seems to be critical. There has been a randomized prospective trial with five year follow-up doing this. Uh, the results are somewhat encouraging. Uh, the main problem has been uh, recurrent MR and durability. So uh, the uh, patient had long-term beneficial effect on LV remodeling more than just an annuloplasty, but again, there was uh, uh, a reasonably large amount of recurrent MR. But this is an early stage uh, in showing some encouragement to work down in the ventricle as well as the annulus. The fundamental problem here is that the papillary muscles aren't all amenable anatomically to being brought together because some of them are like that, some of them are like that, and some of them are like that, with cordy coming up all over the place. And you just see that here, single anterior papillary muscle, thumb sticking up 50% of the time, single posterior papillary muscle, one thumb coming up 21% of the time. And we do see quite a few patients when we're repairing mitral valves that look like this. This is the ventricle open and the uh, posterior mitral leaflet here, aorta over here. And you can see here there's no really well-defined area where those papillary muscles are completely freed up from the ventricle. The cordia coming down. So it's very hard to conceive of how you can get in there and bring the papillary muscles closer together. So these are all issues that have to be worked out. The moment we're stuck with uh, restrictive annuloplasty, Dr. Carpentier, uh, designed a ring specifically for uh, these ischemic patients and uh, he put a little bump inwards here to try to bring that area in, overcorrect it a little bit. You can see that's his regular ring there and this is his ischemic MR ring. Uh, we, think, we thought he was on the right path but this simply did not seem to be a big enough correction to have any impact and that's what's proven to be the case. So we went back to the work of Dr. Jerome Kay, who in 1970 introduced a very major plication of the P2, P3 segment for ischemic uh, uh, heart disease, ischemic MR. And he would placate up to 70% of the posterior annulus with this stitch here. So we decided that given the fact that all through this presentation you've noticed that the P2, P3, A2, A3 is the area most affected in all patients, in all the different studies, that it might be worth focusing, this is just a nice follow-up he did 10 years later with some good results, that instead of uh, doing a circumferential annuloplasty that is uh, symmetrical in its reduction, there's no reason to be reducing this area here because it's very rare for there to be an appositional problem in this area. A1, P1, A2, P2 are rarely involved 
with lack of apposition. It's all over here. You can see here that anterior leaflet bulging. You can see from the amount of leaflet showing there's very little apposition left here. And so uh, if you look at this stay stitch here, what we're going to do is pretty much placate this whole area from here to here. And uh, you can look over here. This is the uh, Dacron. We use proline for our stay and Dacron for the plication. And you can see here, this is the plication going across the commissure and coming down over and over, taking up pretty much all of uh, P3. And uh, so we'll go now and you watch this area here and see where it is in relation to this. You can see there's that stitch and there's the plicating stitch. So we've made a tremendous reduction all in the P3 area, all over there in that corner. And uh, now the reason the K-annuloplasty was abandoned was this simple stitch would work its way loose and there was poor durability. So we decided we'd put an annuloplasty ring on top to reinforce it. This ring does not reduce anything at all. This is simply to reinforce this area. We use a full ring now uh, because the, uh, of the fact that in ischemic MR, this area can stretch. So we've gone back to a full ring. But this is our uh, two-layer repair. There's a video of this on my website. And it's got post-op uh, 3D echo showing how the papillary muscles have become slack and uh, the tethering is gone. So this is something we've not really uh, studied much, but I think this particular approach deserves uh, a revisiting. So here you can see pre-op and here you can see post-op. We've got plenty of uh, annular area here because we haven't reduced the annular area at all over here. It's all right in this corner here. So this great big corner here has been tucked away. And we've done uh, over 200 of these now. It's about 10% of our total experience. And uh, the people have left the hospital almost all with either no MR or just very mild MR. And at three to four years of follow-up, they've uh, mostly got mild MR or mild to moderate MR, very little moderate or, moderate, uh, or moderately severe or severe MR in a follow-up now going out past 10 years. Uh, freedom from reoperation has been very low and quite comparable to our other patients. And freedom from significant late MR has been very low. So in this selected group of patients, we think we have found a way that potentially may be a part of a solution to the treatment of these ischemic MR patients. But we're looking forward with our MRI colleagues to doing some further studies to see exactly what's going on with this repair. So the opti optimal uh, criteria for uh, repair are MR2 plus or greater, mitral annular diameter 38 to 40 millimeters, at least an EF of 30%. We've learned from bitter experience not to try to revive these really bad <coughs> ventricles. A viable myocardium, uh, good RV function, and operable coronary disease. You don't want to be doing diffusely disease challenging coronary bypass on one of these patients. Contraindications, these are the people who have gone over the top and now have dilated cardiomyopathy, severe coronary disease, previous CAB especially bad, advanced stage frailty, because we do have options now for these people, improved medical therapy, resynchronization can in some cases have a dramatic effect on ischemic MR. Uh, we've got our mitra clip, we've got our percutaneous mitral valve repairs, and of course in younger people we have transplantation support devices. So uh, in conclusion, uh, you can see that the precise mechanism of ischemic MR continue to be studied and our knowledge remains incomplete, particularly in the ventricular part. I think the mechanism now is understood a lot better than it was even five years ago, but the ventricular part still remains in this survival deficit that continues despite a competent uh, mitral valve. And we need to find better ways to stop the LV deteriorating over time. Many different uh, devices are, are available and, are, and for more are coming. Uh, but in a well-defined group of classical ischemic MR patients, this is a very well-defined group according to the standard definition we now have of ischemic MR, the technique of a very severely restrictive postromedial annular plastic, severe in that area but not causing mitral stenosis, has produced a high initial success with reasonable long-term durability. And uh, as I mentioned, we're organizing more LV studies in these patients. So I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, end the year on uh, this note, and thank you for your attention.
Dr. <coughs> Lori, thank you for that fantastic um, review. We always learn um, from you, and I think it's a perfect topic to open up for discussion. Hey, Gerald, thank you. That's a really uh, inclusive talk. Um, there are two groups of patients that we see. Our patients with ischemic MR could present in one of two ways. One would be the heart failure where the mitral regurge is the predominant issue. And I presume the treatment there would be whatever repair you choose plus bypass whatever needs to be bypassed. The more uh, difficult group is the, pay, is the group who present with ischemia, angina, or, and they have coronary disease, and they have mitral regurge. And the question is, in those patients, if you find moderate regurge, do you routinely repair? Uh, does, tell me how to approach, because we often ignore moderate regurgitation in patients with coronary disease that we're considering uh, bypass surgery. Right. Yes, this is, this is certainly the difficult uh, question to answer, and this is what the study, that uh, CTSN study was supposed to answer that uh, was a, the disaster technically. But uh, basically, uh, the standard guidelines now are to, if you're doing coronary bypass surgery, to consider seriously repairing the valve. And this procedure, this little stitch takes 15, 20 minutes. That's the other advantage of it. It's a very quick addition to the procedure. Uh, intraoperatively, we do get a lot of information in that we're able to uh, get the patient under anesthesia and uh, adjust the filling conditions and the peripheral vascular resistance conditions. And we'll often get some sense of uh, whether the patient's likely to improve because about half these people will improve over time without any intervention. And if their MR goes away after they're put to sleep, uh, then, uh, we, you know, we tend to, and it's just barely moderate, we tend to leave it alone. If it's there and it persists, no matter what the filling pressures and the loading, we tend to fix it. So that's probably the decision point at that point. Uh, it gives us some idea of how dynamic it is or how fixed it is. But uh, with this fairly simple procedure, we tend to be a little more aggressive. But if it's mild, mild to moderate uh, pre-op, and then you get them in and it goes away, then you need, you've got them scheduled for mitral valve repair, and the anesthesiologist calls you in and says, he doesn't have MR, then usually we leave those alone. And just one quick and easier question, I guess, is <clears throat> it's a big difference between mild, moderate, and severe MR. What's the gold standard for qualitatively or quantitatively assessing uh, my, the severity of mitral regurge? Well, we go by Dr. Zogby's criteria, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> but the issue, I mean, there's been this big debate about uh, what should we call severe, is, is moderate MR in people with bad ventricles really moderate MR? I, I know there's been this big discussion about the nomenclature of MR in people with a stroke volume of 30 mils, if they have mild to moderate MR with a leak of 30 mils, is that really moderate or should you call it severe? And I don't know where all that's ending up, but uh, as I go through all this stuff, I wonder whether what we're calling moderate MR in these people with ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation with this complex posterior wall business, whether we're going to look back and wonder whether maybe we should have taken the moderate in this setting more seriously than we have because the prognosis is not good. The moderate ischemic MR prognosis is not as good as the moderate uh, myxomatous prognosis in terms of survival. Gerald, I really uh, enjoyed your talk because it is quite comprehensive and we haven't really talked about ischemic MR. Going back to Al's question, it is really among the most difficult diagnosis of how do you diagnose severe regurgitation in an ischemic disease. And as you know, the past three years have been controversy of where the cutoff should be from a quantitation point of view. And I think there is a realignment now with the new guidelines that the ASC, I you know, had the privilege to chair that. In addition to ACC, I think there is convergence to be more specific as opposed to more sensitive as to where do you put the cutoff. So the cutoff now is from a 
an echo point of view is an effective reversed into orifice area of greater than 0.4 centimeters squared. So more is more uh, specific, if you will. Uh, <coughs> reversed in volume obviously can vary. And reversed in fraction can vary. Uh, I mean, once you get to smaller volumes of total output of the ventricle, this is where errors come into play. And reversed in volume, reversed in fraction are really difficult to quantitate. Usually it is less than your usual 60 ml. Uh, so you would allow 30, 35, something like this. And this is w w some of the issue that comes to play. So one, the recommendations are to be more specific as opposed to more sensitive So you, for you to intervene on, on the valve. And the question to you, Gerald, is, I mean, obviously it is a disease of the ventricle, right? And even mild degrees of mitral regurgitation, just like you showed and many data have showed, that you have a worse prognosis. It's not because of the regurgitation, but because of the ventricle. And it is basically an index of how bad the ventricle, how remodeled the ventricle is. So although you may refine the techniques very well for repair and have almost no recurrence, right? Are we, do you think, I mean, knowing the data as you well know it, are we gonna impact prognosis? Although the ventricle reverse remodels a little bit, maybe the patients feel a little better, but it looks like their outcome is really has not been budging lately. Well, I think uh, we, obviously we've been working very hard on the myxomatous and these people are much less common and after the Cleveland Clinic paper came out, they went from common to rare because people read that paper and said, well, we're not going to refer people for surgery anyway. Uh, but uh, the, the small number we did where we had 3D echo, we definitely got the impression that the, we weren't just uh, making the annulus smaller. This major movement of that P2 segment over towards the septum was carrying the ventricle with it. And in some of these people, it was clear, you could easily see it on the echo on the long axis picture of the ventricle, that these papillary muscles and cordy went from like this pre-op to like this post-op. I mean, this, this is only a small anecdotal report, but I mean, and if you go to my website, you'll see one of those echoes. So it's still conceivable, I think, that a major reduction at the annual level can drag over the ventricle with it enough to actually have some sub-annular impact. And these are the things I've been talking to uh, Deepan about, uh, trying to do some more studies. And we do have some matched pairs, fortunately, that we're going to look at that we've accumulated over the years of pre- and post-op MRI. But I think the whole measurement of strain and torsion uh, have been overlooked. And now that we've got technologies coming we can measure, I think it's going to give us a lot of insight. I mean, as I've read about this stuff and, uh, you know, all this balance between the endocardium of the heart twisting one direction while the epicardium is twisting the other direction and the shear factors and all these different areas that can be impacted. It's, it's not a simple thing like we just think we're fixing a simple problem everything's going to get better. It's far more complex and our therapy has to be adjusted to make sure all these twists and shears and everything are happening properly too. And we may have a whole different set of dimensions we want to target to get to to make things better. So. There's just some really fundamental questions that have never been addressed because of lack of technology. And this strain paper that literally just came out last month is the beginning of a new era, I believe, and that's why I hope we're going to be part of that and, and Deep End's going to get going and measure some strain for us. I think it all comes down to strain. That's the whole secret of life. Strain management. Well, fantastic, unless there are any other questions. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you.